Revelation 19, turn there very quickly, and then 2 Peter chapter 2. I had a, I told Michael the other day, me and Michael and, and uh, Michaela and Jaden would, went out camping the other night. We got the trailer out and dewinterized it and was just checking to make sure everything was okay with it. And uh, told Michael that I had a message on my heart. I was angry at that doctor that turned down that little baby. I think it was a boy that turned down that little boy for treatment. That made me angry. And it, when I, sometimes I get vengeful and I was going to preach vengeance on him, hoping that he would hear it all the way out there in Kenya. I mean, we broadcast on the radio, right? So anyway, um, but anyway, I had a message on my heart and God changed it yesterday. So I'm not going to be near as vengeful and mean and ugly as I was going to be this morning, but maybe a little bit for you. Because what I'm going to preach this morning, I hope it scares you. I hope it scares you. We need a good jolt every now and then. We need to get shaken, shaken up every now and then by the Lord. Amen? So, Revelation 19, I started preaching this here a while back. Uh, verse 11, I saw heaven open, and behold, white horses, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. And his eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth go the sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he, shall, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Underline that. God is love, is he not? But God also has a wrath that he's going to pour out. He's going to pour it out on people that you know. He's going to pour it out on people that you're related to. He's going to pour it out on people that you may be sitting next to in church. Never know. But he's going to pour out his wrath nonetheless. And that ought to shake God's people up. Now, I know that some say, well, you know, once you're saved, that's it. You're saved forever, and you don't have to worry about that, and you don't worry about the wrath of God, and this, and that, and the other. But I'm here to tell you that it's all right if you have a proper fear of the Lord. A proper fear of what God should have done with you and didn't, what God can do with you. Now, he's not going to break his promise, and I understand that, but I'm here to tell you, it's good to be shaken up every now and then and ask God, God, am I saved? Am I saved? Okay? You'll find your answer to that in the Bible. First John, John said, these things have we written that you may know that you have eternal life. And I want you, above all things, to know whether or not you have eternal life, everlasting life. I want you to know that beyond any shadow of any doubt whatsoever. I want you to know that. Now, 2 Peter chapter 2, the reason why I kind of connected this was here a while back as part of this series, I preached about how when God does something, if he does it the first time, it's good. If he does it the second time, it's better than good. It's better than it was. Your first birth was good because everybody said, oh, you, the doctor came out and said it's a boy or it's a girl or they're both boys or all three of them's girls or whatever. Anyway, the doctor came out and told the good news of you being born. And everybody went, oh, yay, congratulations. So that, that was good. But your second life, your second birth is far better than your first one. Amen. When you, listen, in your second birth, the angels of heaven rejoiced over one that was saved and more than over the 99 that were already saved. Amen. Angels rejoiced. Uh, this, this world here, I love, we, we took a, uh, me and Michael took a, a hike, St. Francis State Park. 
we got on this trail and no sooner than we got on the trail I looked and there's a little there's a little bluff there and I said Michaela it's my fault Michaela Jaden why don't you scramble up that little cliff there and stand there and let your daddy take your picture so they got up a little bit and I said no get up higher so they got up a little higher no there's one more go one more up there and they got up there Michael took a picture and I'm not kidding you 10 seconds after he took that picture Jaden went sliding off down that cliff Boom, ba boom, ba boom, ba boom. And of course, me and Michael, we just stood there and froze for a minute. It looked like he was in the air for several seconds. And then finally, we went running over there, and Michael was going, Oh, son, are you okay? And so he's got a little notch right here on his nose. And he's got a place up here on his head that was bleeding a little bit. And daddy carried him for a while until he finally felt better. Then he walked around and we had a good time. But I love this world that God's given us. I love, I told, I told Michael, I pointed out the place. I said, Michael, you remember that sermon, uh, the cycles of Christian growth? And he said, yeah. And I pointed to a bluff and I said, right there is where God gave me that message. I was looking down there at the big river and God gave me that message about cycles, about how the, all the rivers run into the sea. And I just, I love sitting outside and I could just stop and listen to that river flowing. And I could sit and listen to that for hours. There's nothing like it. I mean, if you like listening to good music, that's okay. But let me tell you, nature sings better than any man could ever hope to sing. Nature praises God better than all of that. What I'm saying is this world is great. The next world, you have no idea what's in store for you. Amen? Now that's how God does it. That's how God does it. Satan is just the opposite. He'll give you all the goods first. And then it always goes downhill from there. So look at your Bible, 2 Peter chapter 2. Do you believe the word of God this morning? Say amen. amen. For if after they've escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, if they are again entangled therein and overcome. I want you to stop now and I want you to think about here's you and the world is just sort of like a creeping vine, like a vine from Mars. Like invasion of the body snatchers type thing. And the world is creeping up behind you to try to get a hold of you again. How many of you have ever experienced that? You knew the world was pulling at you, trying to get you to come back, right? all the time watch out because the Bible saying if they've escaped through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ they're again entangled therein and overcome look at your Bible the latter end is worse with them than the beginning do you believe your Bible for it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness then after they have known it, to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. You know what that is, don't you? That's your Bible. They went to a church. They heard the Bible. Oh, I believe that. Come down to the altar. Dump out some sins. And they had maybe, every part of them had intentions of giving all of the sins to God but while they were down there, the devil already was pulling at them saying, we're not going to give God that one, are we? And they fell for it. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb. If God said it's true, what does that mean? It's true. The dog is turned to his own vomit again. Have you ever seen that? 
Have you ever seen a dog puke something up and then go back over to it and lap it up? Now let me tell you, God designed dogs to do that. And he designed them so that he could show us what he's talking about. You left the puke of the old world, didn't you? You left the puke of the old world. Your body kicked it out and said, we don't, this is not good for us. We don't want this in us. And so your body rejected that. You left the vomit of the old world. Went and played church for a while. And then for some reason, the scent of that vomit lured you back. This Bible's right. Or the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. God designed pigs to do that. My choir director, brother Dennis Knowles, good man, good Christian man, I loved him. He taught me how to sing proper. And he had a sign in his office door that said, never try to teach a pig to sing. It wastes your time and it annoys the pig. And I stood in choir next to some of those pigs. They were in choir and he was trying to teach them how to sing and all it was bother them and they didn't sing like they should. And it made the whole choir sound bad. It wasted his time and it annoyed the pig. My, Mr. Dennis Nall, he got a hold of me one time. He said, Mike, you're not singing right. He had me singing. And he said, you scoop the notes. I said, what does that mean? He said, the note, you should hit the note going, ah. Oh. He said, you're going, ah. Oh. He said, cut it out. And I went, oh. So I cut it out. I didn't want to be a pig in the choir. Because I knew what that sign was for, and I knew who it was for. It was for the pigs. God designed pigs to where they, no matter how well you wash them, when you're done, they're going to run right back into, get this, there's some animals that will never defecate anywhere near where they're going to eat. Pigs are not one of them. They will throw out their waste and then they'll get down in it all around. And if you've ever smelled pig waste, it's awful. Terrible. People don't want to live around somebody that's raising hogs. Amen? Now there's wisdom in this. Now I want you to think about this. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, help me to preach this. You laid it on my heart. And God, you did not tell me how you want me to preach it. So I'm going to have to rely upon you. To show me how you would have me go. Lord, I got a lot of verses here. And I don't know which ones are the ones you want me to give out. So Lord, I'm just going to try to follow you as best as I can. But Father, put it in us, God. Put it in us to know. That a lot of times we're going to be worshiping you next to pigs. We're going to be here in the house of God with dogs who'll go back after their own vomit. And Lord, when I see that in people, it breaks my heart. But Father, I've, you know, Lord, I've preached message. I've preached funerals to dogs who return to their own vomit. Father, give me grace. Show me how you want me to preach this. Let it be a blessing to others. Father, I need it. Everybody else needs it. 
Lord, just help me to preach it and help us to understand it. We pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, amen. Several years ago, I was, um, I, the, the way I'm going to preach this, I, God's given me examples of people that I've known. We had a man come by our church. A lot of times people will come because we're close to, to the two highways, Highway 55, Highway 67, and they'll pull in here. Also, Bethel is phone book ahead of First Baptist. So maybe we might consider changing our name to Zebra Bethel Church. That way we're not so high up in the phone book. But they'll come by or they'll call and they want help. And the Bible says give to him that ask. And so anybody that comes by for help, I feel compelled to at least try to give them something. I'll, and when I give them money, if I give them money, I'll give them a Bible, give them a, a DVD to watch or whatever. We've done that before and helped and prayed with several people. That, and there was a man that came by and he was a, he was a drunkard. And I could smell it on him, but he asked for help. He wanted gas money, and I said, I'm not going to give you money, but I am going to take you down here to the gas station and fill your car up. And, and he said, he said, I'm trying to get a job and trying to get my life back in order, and I prayed with that man. Not too long after that, he called me. I gave, he had the phone number, and he called here. And he's crying. He said, will you please come over here? He said, my daughter was over here. And she was in a terrible accident. She's in ICU. And he said, they don't expect her to live. He said, will you come over here? And I went over there, and his daughter was lying there in a coma, and I prayed, and I, and I started witnessing to the man, and I said, you know, you can know whether or not, see that girl? You can know whether or not you're going to end up like her one of these days, and you're going to know whether or not you can have heaven for all of eternity. You can know that. And I witnessed to him, showed him verses of Scripture, and I had prayed, and he prayed the sinner's prayer, and I, 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 I thought that he was saved. His daughter got better and came up out of that hospital and lived. And I kept trying to stay in touch with this man, invite him to church, and he would come. And then he brought some family members there for a while, and they came. And, but then after a while, I didn't see him anymore. Didn't see him for a long time. And then his family called and said, will you preach his funeral? He was out drunk one night slammed his car into a tree, killed him instantly. Will you preach his funeral? Now I went to, I'm using this story to tell you that man was a dog that returned to his vomit and I loved him. And I cared about him and I prayed with him and I prayed for him and I prayed over his daughter, prayed that God would heal his daughter and God healed his daughter. Brought her up out of the hospital. He saw the miracles of God. He saw God answer prayer. And the dog still returned to his own vomit. After I got done, he had a pauper's funeral. They make a casket made out of cardboard. It looks nice, but there ain't nothing there. They finally found somebody that would dig the grave for this man for almost nothing. I preached the man's funeral when I got done. I'm shaking hands with the family members. We're going to head out to the cemetery. They got a pauper's area out there where they don't charge anybody. They just put them down in there. And when I got done shaking everybody's hands, I could, there was some fellows that were lingering. Sort of in the background over by the casket. And when everybody walked out of there, they opened up a box and pulled out a portable ice chest. And they pulled Budweiser bottles out of that ice chest and set it down in that man's coffin. I was furious. And we took that man, we laid him down in that ground with those ice cold Budweiser bottles there. And he was in a place where he would have given anything to just lick the frost off the outside of that bottle. But I guarantee you, he would not want to drink out of what was in that bottle because that's what put him where he is now and you say how can you know that I'm telling you the dog returned to his own and the sow turned to the wallowing in her mire and you uh, listen I have been in church all my life and I have seen people 
play church. People that at one time were my Sunday school teacher, I didn't know it at the time, but I was sitting in the classroom being taught by a dog. And one time there was a man, and I just, I looked up to this man, I adored this man. He was a Sunday school teacher. He was an usher in the church. And I remember sitting kind of back there in the back row, and the ushers were standing back there. They were fixing to come forward and take the offering. And all four of them lined up back there, and the preacher, Brother Robert Sherry, said, does everybody here love the Lord? And they know they're going to heaven. And I looked and everybody's raising their hands and said, yes. And I looked at that man. God had me look at that man. And he just stood there stone cold like this. And I went, why didn't he say something? He was a dog. And I didn't know it, at the, but he was a whoremongering dog. And he had been out whoremongering left his wife never to return. There was another man that I looked up to. See, I, when I came to church here, I thought that all of these people here were God's people. That they were holy people. And I adored them. I looked up to them. And there was a man here, his wife, he had three children, all members of the church. Him, a de or I don't know if he was a deacon, but he served in some capacity in the church. I remember that. And then next thing you know, he quit coming. And I didn't see him. I didn't understand at that. I didn't understand what was wrong, what was going on. And then after a while, his wife quit coming. Because I guess in order to keep her marriage, she kind of followed her husband a little bit. Pulled her own family out of church. Well, God got a hold of the wife. Because you ladies, God can shake you easier than some of us men. God got a hold of his wife and she said, you're not dragging me down with you. So she started coming back and started bringing her children back to church. But he was gone. His daughter told years later, she said, every morning we'd get up, dad would lay in bed, hung over, and sometimes pretend to sleep while we were getting ready for church. And he would not get up until we left for church because he didn't want us looking at him and him feeling guilty that his wife and his family were getting ready for church and he wasn't. And she said, I'll never forget it. She said, I saw my daddy. He got up. He went to the closet, got a suit out, laid it on the bed. And he stood there and looked at it. And she said, then he put the suit back up in the closet and laid down until the family left for church. And his brains were splattered out here on 110 Highway. Because he was driving home, fog everywhere, couldn't see nothing. And he slammed his car into one of those embankments over at 110 Highway and splattered his brains everywhere. Dog. Dogs return to vomit. Sows will always return to the wallowing in the mire. That's how they are. That's their nature. And I know, I know that every one of you, what is it? Every one of you can feel the world reaching after you to entangle you. Every one of you can. You know it. And sometimes I can see it. Now, God does not give me visions of how you're living and what's going on in your life. 
and most of the time I do not want to know. But sometimes I can just see the vines getting you. Because you know, one of the signs is you're not here like you used to be. Can I say that? And preach that? Because that's, I mean, I don't, I'm not with you every day while you're supposed to be reading your Bible. And I'm not around you every day while you're supposed to be praying. But usually, prayer and Bible reading stop. And then, going to church slows way down. And the devil will give you every excuse. He's got a list 4,000 pages long of why you didn't go to church. And if one of them doesn't work, he'll flip the page and he'll give you that one. If that doesn't work, he'll flip the page and, oh, this is, I've used this one before on him. Hey, what about this one right here? And then lo and behold, you say, yeah, I can't go to church today. I have seen the list. And I usually know it when I hear it. Pastoring for, let's see, since 19, September 1990, I started seeing the list. And people stopped coming to church, stopped reading their Bible, stopped praying. Here's the entanglement. If you'll recognize that, you can put a stop to it. Usually it's pretty simple. Okay? You stand. Devil, you're not getting me. You know what you're doing. And you're not getting me. Fellas, listen to me. Guys, guys in this church, I want you to listen to me. I don't care how old you are, I want you to listen to me. God uses men in a church in a way that sometimes you don't even see it. But God has put the height of authority on the men. Am I right? He's put the hierarchy of authority on the men in the home. And here that man was, I was talking about that dog, that when he dropped out, he pulled his, sucked his family down with him. And his wife took a stand and said, you're not dragging me down with you. But God will work on the men, or excuse me, the devil will work on the men, and he'll go after them because you're standing in the way of his delicacies, his delights. His delights is your wife and children. His delights are in the weak of the home. That's what he, I mean, think about it. Which is better to eat, that old tough meat? Because a cow, a bull's been using them muscles all the time. No, it's that sweet meat in the middle where... God give cows and deer muscles that they never use. And they taste awesome, don't they? And it doesn't matter how bad you burn them, they're still good and tender. Right? Some tenderloins. Okay? The devil knows the sweet meat is behind the tough meat. And that's where he's headed, but he's got to get you out of the way. So men, I promise you, I promise you, you're the number one target. I sat back here one time, years ago, bawling my eyes out because everything in me and around me was telling me to leave. Get out of the church, leave your wife and family, get out. And I could feel the entanglement. And it scared me. It scared me. I actually felt like leaving. And it scared me. And during that time, the devil said, Mike, I'll give you anything you want. 
In fact, I'll give you everything you want. See, he always pushes the delights of the flesh on you, and he'll tell you, I'll give you. Who, if, you've, if you've ever taken drugs, if you've ever smoked dope, meth, pot, heroin, any of that stuff, it feels like nothing you've ever felt before, and it's the great feeling in the world until it runs out. And then what it does after that is the awfulest thing that you could ever go through. Isn't that how the devil works? Isn't that how he works? Alcohol does the same thing. Sex does the same thing. Cursing. Why does cursing feel so good? I mean, you can say, wagon trail. And it doesn't feel good, does it? It doesn't feel like saying a curse word, does it? But you know how words are once you say them and you get that rush. Then you realize your wife and kids heard that. Or the neighbors heard it. Or your wife was on Facebook Live and everybody heard it. And then it all went down here. Am I right? Why is it that sin, sin feels so good? Until it's over with. Amnon lusted after his own half sister. Amnon was a. And he finally figured out, him and a buddy of his, you better watch who your buddies are. Him and his buddy figured out a way that he would pretend that he was sick and he would say, I, I want my sister to come in and. and Bring me some chicken soup and some, some, something nice because I, I feel terrible. And he feigned to be sick. And when she got him in there, he pulled her down and raped her. And he had been lusting after her for months. And you know, the Bible says that as soon as he did, he hated her. Thrust her out. Get out of here. Now she's a woman that has been destroyed. And now Amnon got what he wanted and he despised her. Wasn't even going to take her as wife. And Absalom killed him. Out of vengeance. He said, that was my sister. I don't care if you are my brother. That was my sister. He killed him out of vengeance. That's the kind of stuff you want. Because that's, that's what you'll get if you're a dog or you're a sow. When you start feeling the grip that's the time to shake loose and get the sword out the only thing to do is just, just cut them get back I'm not preaching anything down my nose at anybody I'm not preaching anything that I have not felt and experienced multiple times so I know what I'm talking about and I have begged God, God, please don't let me be one of those dogs. I don't want to go back. I don't want it. You say that to God, God will know whether you mean it. And God won't let you be a sow. He won't let you be a dog. He'll make you a lion, amen. Rawr! Get back with me, devil! That's what he'll do. But all it takes is you standing and saying, I'm not having it, I'm not going back. So, let's have an invitation, can we? And let's just have some people who come forward I'm not going back. Can we do that? Yes, Ian. Go ahead and stand and give it. Come up here. So are you talking to my tie so everybody can hear it? Thank you for preaching that message. Because last night, the temptation of the world to pull me back in, it's been a year. It, was just, it just came upon me the last couple of days. It was so intense that I remember last night just saying, wow. He's trying to get me back. Barely slept all night, but I knew I'd be here today. 
and then you preach this message. So thank you for doing that. Hey, you're going the wrong direction. <laughs> Let's have some people come and say, I'm not going back. I'm not going back. You folks at home, get down on your knees. Pull your car over if you're watching online and driving. Or get down. I love you, buddy. Get down on your couch or at your bedside or wherever your base you are. And get down on your knees and say, I'm not going back. Because we all want to. That's the part that we hate. So, and we're ashamed of. We're ashamed of the fact that we want to go back. I understand that shame. I understand it. I get it. But you tell the devil, today's not your day, and tomorrow's not looking real good either. Amen? Father, I didn't know what you had in mind. And here I got all those notes. And I thank you, Lord, for helping me preach it today, the way you wanted it done. Lord, I loved those men. I looked up to them. I thought they were men. And I saw them turn around and go back to the mire that they were in, go back to the vomit. And God, that hurt my feelings. Because I didn't think Christians were supposed to do that. It shook me, God. But I know, Father, you had a reason for it. And I know, Lord, sometimes that there's going to be dogs that are going to come in here. And they're going to pretend. Fooled by so many people. I've been lied to. Deceived by sows, by dogs who put on a fair show and had every intention of going back to the vomit. Some of them, like with us, maybe they're really not dogs. The devil just made them think that they were. And they're headed back to the vomit. But God, I pray, Lord, that you would stop them. Because they're not dogs. They're your sons. They're your... To stop them, God. And bring them back. And Father, Lord, it is manifest that in this building today, that there were some people that were being pulled back. And I thank you, God, for giving us a place where we for, can forget about the shame of what we were thinking about doing. I thank you, God, that you've enabled me to be honest about me so that it can help them. Because I know, Lord, what they go through. And I know about being pulled back and I want no part of it because I've read and seen the destruction that comes I can see father that the latter end is going to be worse with them than the beginning and I believe your word and I want no part of that father we pray dear God that you would just convict every heart and convince us Lord of the most high God we're not dogs. We're not sows. And Father, I just pray, dear God, help every one of us, Lord, who feel the entanglement coming. God, get us back on our knees where we need to be. Get us back in the Word, Father. Get us back, Lord, among some people, God, that will pray with us and pray for us and not look down their, their nose at us. And will say to us, I can see what's going on in your life and I want you to know I love you. And I want to help you. God, I thank you for that kind of church today. God bless your people for that knowledge, Father, that they have overcome today. And the devil tried to win a victory over them. And God, you prevailed once again. 
And Father, give us hope, Lord, that we know that you'll do it again for us because you love us. Bless you, people. We pray in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.